There is a revolution underway. People are revolting against Games Workshop, and they are coming to Battletech. At least if the internet is to be believed. Hello, everybody. My name is Preston Poulter. Welcome to my channel, Lords of Iron. So, I've been shipping out all my comic books related to do with my Kickstarter. I got another one going actually right now. Hey, link in the description if you want to see some awesome comics. But... While I've been shipping and listening, I've been, you know, looking at the internet in the Battletech forum. There's like, I'm left Games Workshop. I'm here to hang out with you Battletech guys. What's up? And Wargamer Fritz. Hey, info card. Just, you know, click the little I. Uh, Wargamer Fritz, he's big into Games Workshop. And he's saying he's got friends who are like, I spend 10000 a year in Warhammer, you know, Games Workshop minis. But... Their latest policies, uh, just, I don't want to collapse the revolution here, just a little talking point. Games Workshop has been kind of aggressive lately about policing their IPs. And so fan creations are now falling under scrutiny, and maybe some channels are getting strikes and whatnot. And that is causing some backlash amongst their fans. Whatever. So these fans, as in the case Wargamer Fritz is relaying to us, are like, I don't like what Games Workshop's doing, screw them. I'm going to spend my ten grand a year in Battletech. But as Wargamer Fritz said, I don't think there's $10,000 worth of Battletech merch that you can get, which does kind of show that there's a bit of a lack of depth. To me, if Battletech wants to grow, I think this fan-related content and third-party stuff, look what happened when Wizards of the Coast aggressively licensed out their D&D property, right? It exploded. So the more you can get other people making content in and around it, the more you're going to allow the hobby to grow. So... I don't know if the growth of Battletech is really going to be down to Catalyst Labs, although they're certainly going to be in the leader position. Um, but as much as it's going to be, you know, fans, you know, going out to shows and doing Battletech demos and trying to get people in and making YouTube videos and all that good jazz. But here's the thing about the Battletech universe. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And here, this is another clip from Renegade HPG, I think it is, and again, just, you, you can click on that for the Robert Shred interview. If you haven't already listened to it, it's a great interview, but this is an early Battletech novelist talking about how kind of ill-considered the initial Battletech universe, which is still kind of the Battletech universe we're in. Take a listen. Bill Keith tried to explain the weirdnesses of the game, you know, things like the auto cannons carrying 12 rounds. Right. Right. You know, so he made up the whole cassette ammunition thing. Okay. 12 cassettes of now, multiple. One th I, I do remember reading that novel and the cassette information for the auto cannon. Like, oh, that makes To me, it's like auto cannon should really have like a whole bunch of rounds and just, you know, it's an abstraction that it can fire 12 times. But really, when it's firing, it's firing kind of a continuous stream of many rounds. Uh, over that time, they went with a different direction. Again, this is where, like, I really think they needed to invest a lot more time considering a lot of their design choices here, because, again, the Battletech universe has issues. Multiple rounds. You know, the technology, other than the fusion reactors and the, the energy weapons, right, basically World War II level technology. Okay. So, you know, I had, okay, that's a brief. Okay, we'll, we'll run with that. You know, no satellites is why it was a big deal when I gave Wolf Stragoon the satellite as part of the explanation of why they could do things other people couldn't do. Um, I wrote a scene with an aerospace pilot pulling high Gs and I basically wrote him wearing the equivalent of a late World War II pressure suit, which used water to keep the blood flowing by pumping it around the thing. And I just, oh, no, no, that's too high tech. Okay. You know, but I, I did my research, you know, mm. and it's World War II tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, can't have that. Okay. Yeah. You can, um, you can jump from star system to star system, but you can't pump water in your, in your, uh, your, in flight your jump suit. suit. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense. Right. For that matter, uh, I did a video a while back uh, about flamers sucking in the rules. I got some some pretty heated comments, if you'll forgive the pun. But what people were objecting to was, well, flamers are cool if you play with the optional rule where they do damage and heat. 
And hey, what about if you use them to clear woods and you can set woods on fire and they can create smoke and really you can use them to kind of tactically control the map that way. Cool story, bro. There's one problem with all that. That's not in here, right? These are the rules, the latest catalyst rules. You can't set woods on fire with flamers in this book. You can't. Okay? So this book pretty much codifies, you know, you go and you read, what do flamers do? Instead of doing two, you know, for the cost of three heat, instead of doing two damage to your opponent, you can go, ha ha, that's two heat. And you guys can sit around and say, what a great benefit. Flamers are awesome if you want. You're just going to lose in tournaments. Now, there was one valid point on the Flamer video, by the way. They're pretty good against infantry, so if you're using combined arms against infantry, Flamers are good. Hooray. That's like, that was like the only valid point out of all the comments in that video because, again, Catalyst Labs is pretty much taking the universe as it exists and just kind of being a caretaker. And, well, Flamers sucked in the original rules. Guess what? They're still sucking. So let me tell you what area I, as, you know, kind of a fan creating stuff, kind of want to focus on, and that's, that's variant mechs, right? So if we go and we look in here, this very much reminds me of the Robert Shred interview where they're talking about World War II level technology, right? And okay, so if we're looking at World War II, well, if we look at like, like my story, White Lily, about the two deadliest female fighter pilots that ever lived, one of the planes that's very prevalent in there is the American P-39 Aracobra. Now, the Aracobra was made by Bell here in the United States. It was kind of a forerunner to the A-10, if you want. The engine was behind the pilot, which was highly unusual in those World War II fighters where typically the engine is part of the nose. The engine was behind the pilot, and there was a drive shaft to run the propeller that went between the pilot's feet. So you could just walk, look down, and you know there, there's the drive shaft that turned the propeller going straight through the cockpit. You did not want to crash because you had this heavy engine behind you, which would have a nasty habit of coming forward and crushing the pilot in a crash. That's kind of bad. But the good thing about it is it freed up a lot of space in the nose for a lot of weapons. The Americans had, you know, like one weapons loadout. Really nobody liked the plane, but we gave a bunch to the Soviets. And the Soviets had a different design philosophy. For the Soviets, they wanted guns centerline. So the Soviets took all the guns off the wings and just, boom, centerline was where it was. So if you look at, say, the Soviet P-39, like you see in my story, White Lily, hey, okay, you can get as an add-on in the Kickstarter, check it out. Um, the weapons are centerline, but if you look at the American version of the P-39, the weapons are in the wings. And if you read through the tech manual, that's very much how they present the mechs. They'll be like, a certain house likes a certain mech a certain way. And okay, that makes sense if we're going with these mechs are manufactured at a central plant, and we got these, these little Rosie the Riveter people, and they're working on the mechs, and boom, here it is. Okay, great. But really, when we start looking at it in terms of like the Mech Warrior role-playing game or the computer game, well, what if I want to vary my mech, right? And really, it makes sense, particularly given how decentralized we are in terms of the way the role-playing game, the way the universe is presented, the when you put more time into, into considering it, is that there's no reason why you can't be swapping out weapon systems on mounts or whatnot, more or less in the field, or at least, say, in your Leopard class dropship that's going around with your mech base from place to place, right? And so if you could be doing variants more prevalently, then it really shouldn't be a house likes this particular variant of a mech. It should be a pilot. Because, you know, like, look, if you're a Battletech player, some people want to sit back and shoot long-range weapons, some people want to run up and whatever. And that mentality, basically, you know, you can think of as analogous to what the pilots themselves preferred tactics would be. And, of course, those pilots would then take those tactics and go back to their mech base and go, Nah, I don't want the LRMs. I want SRMs on this instead. So I think variants should be way more common. And I think we as a player base need to embrace variants. So I'm going to start a series here on this channel where I start talking about a lot of kind of my own variations on things. Because to me... In the universe, it makes sense that there would just be a ton of variations and that individual pilots would be able to express their particular choices for how they wanted a mech to be. I don't know. This is how I'm thinking of stuff. Let me know your thoughts. This has been Preston Poulter with Lords of Iron. Thank you very much for your time. Take care.